First, let me say uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, London is a special place for many reasons, and uh, not the least of which is we're all here today. Um, Black History Month uh, became a major feature of 20th <clears throat> century uh, scholarship and popular history in the United States uh, in uh, the month of February. And hopefully uh, in the 21st century, uh, a Black History Month in October uh, will prove to be an important uh, time of uh, public history in this country. I want to start by saying that uh, we speak here today uh, in the midst of uh, a controversy, as one speaker has been disinvited over a policy difference or something. It's not exactly clear. Political pressure has become a factor. I can't help but think about the many times that Garvey or Du Bois or Nkrumah faced accusations and censorship and were denied the right to participate and to present their views on a podium. Now we must go forward with this occasion, no doubt. But to have a clear conscience, I had to raise my voice to warn against allowing such political pressure to sidetrack our need to speak of freedom and the fight against all forms of exploitation and oppression. In a short time, what needs to be said today at the start of the 21st century about three critical figures of the 20th century, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, and Osajefo Kwame Nkrumah. First, how does their historical context compare with ours? Second, what are some key aspects of what they stood for and accomplished? And third, how can we build in our time on what they did in their time? Now, the end of the 19th century was a time of the zenith of colonialism. We had had, at the end of the 19th century, the Berlin Conference, where European countries uh, carved up Africa. It's a rise of imperialism and the Industrial Age. It led to conflicts among the major capitalist powers and World War I, and then subsequently World War II. All of this was based on the globalization of the industrial system, the extraction of raw materials from all over the world to feed industrial production in the so-called mother countries. This colonization and this consolidation of the global system of industrialization set the stage for the resistance in which these three figures played a prominent role. In other words, the problem pre-configures the solution. One doesn't have a solution independent of the problem, or you might, in fact, be a raving lunatic, completely out of context, though your intentions may be very well-meaning. The point is, if you've got a problem and clarity of the problem and you make a diagnosis of the problem, then you can have a prognosis that somebody might think makes sense. Pan-Africanism was a rising tide of resistance within the networks within colonization, and therefore we can see the genius in what these three individuals represented and the movements that they embodied. So they lived in a new era of global industrialization. People were moving from the rural to the urban, from agriculture to industry, and their Pan-Africanism responded. Our situation is quite different. We live in an era of the transition from the industrial age to the information age. The new technologies of computers and the internet are transforming the world. Used to be, you could become a bin to. I've been to somewhere, I've been there. Now, of course, the actual is uh, complemented and uh, in many ways expanded by the virtual. There's a new social dynamic. Our world is in real time, networks of communication via the internet and the World Wide Web. Transportation uh, in which Migratory patterns of people are unprecedented. People moving around, back and forth, country to country, moving all over. I mean, you've heard people introduced, been here, been there. Um, 
We're all been to. We all been to everywhere. This is a new age. But also bioengineering and the, the whole role of genetics. In the past, we were trapped in the physical reality of the world. It may be that in the future we have choices. This is going to redefine everything. See, it's one thing to talk about ideology. It's another thing to talk about what does science and technology provide for us as real choices that people are, in fact, going to make. This will impact everything. They lived in a world of spatially fixed resources, raw materials, et cetera, while we live in a dynamic environment where technology is mobile and moves around based on policy choices. And this is what presents us with our unique challenge. Now, Garvey, as was indicated from Jamaica, uh, involved in the printing industry, emerged with a vision of global unity against colonization, rooted in an identity that centered the African experience in opposition, really, uh, to the predatory European uh, dynamic, a global identity. His strategy was a mass strategy, up you mighty black race. And to accomplish his aim, it was the use of a newspaper, a newspaper as the principal form of communication, newspaper that was carried by hand by people, the maritime industry, sailors, people who traveled everywhere. That's how the word got out, through a printed newspaper taken uh, throughout the world. In other words, I think the genius of Garvey was the infusing of political ideology into the popular culture of the black experience everywhere in the world. Du Bois, on the other hand, from the United States, focused, in terms of his background, in terms of what he represented, on the intelligentsia, on the uh, idea, the concept that was boiled down to the phrase, the talented tenth. A controversial phrase, but one that is inherently leading us toward the fight for social justice, because what the concept of the talent in tenth represented was his call for college graduates to return to their community and to serve their community. It's a call we should make today. It's a call that needs to be made today, that people who go somewhere and are educated don't have to fall prey to uh, Woodson's comment of the miseducation of the Negro, because after all, we've now had 40 years of black studies. This is a new day. And so we can look forward to people who are educated returning to the community to create the dynamic that we need, because in the end, our empowerment will be our self-organization and our self-definition uh, uh, that we bring to uh, the society. Now, Du Bois uh, had a vision of the end of, of colonialism based on his research and scholarship. He's known for organizing conferences, many conferences, not just the Pan-African Congresses, uh, that uh, his name is associated with, but the congresses that took place in Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta University conferences where, very interesting, while he was focused on the intelligentsia, those conferences were really based on people in the community. They would name a topic like the family, and he would send out uh, notices, and people throughout the South and throughout the United States would go out survey their community and gather data, and they would bring all this information in and then meet for a period of time, a week, and deliberate over these things and then issue a report. So Du Bois, we can say that his genius was grounding a scholarship in the advocacy for freedom by mobilizing the community. Nkrumah, Ghana, Africa, known as the father figure, really, of the mass movements for independence. He represented the realization, the turning into a practical project of what Garvey and Du Bois were talking about. He represented those ideas not about Africa, but in Africa on the ground. I think in terms of what I have to say this morning, the one thing I would point out about Nkrumah is the Akasambo Dam project because the Akasambo Dam project was a very interesting policy option that he chose, which was to develop the productive forces 
so that electricity, not only for Ghana, but the potential of the Akasambo Dam was electricity for many countries in West Africa. And electricity represents the basis of a modern economy. No electricity, in, when the sun goes down, you're in the dark. That enough said. The point is, we need electricity. So I think it's, in the future, we might be thinking of Nkrumah not just as the father of the anti-colonial struggle, but the father of Africa's age of electricity. Now, these three great historical figures, therefore, represent the dialectical forces of black unity. They come from these three different regions, but they all connect together in this global struggle. They all came here. They all had a real role to play in the development of consciousness among African peoples uh, in this country. Uh, they inspired the last half of the 20th century based on what they did in the first half. Their vision remains the foundation of what we stand on against what's been called Afro-pessimism. The idea, you know, that black people are in trouble, worse off, and we are our worst enemy. And we ain't going nowhere, ain't been nowhere, ain't nowhere, ain't going nowhere. This kind of pessimism. Now we all know that if you look around in the community, what you see might in fact make you pessimistic. So you have to reach for something to give you some kind of hope some kind of vision of the future, some basis on which you can teach the children. And that's what we get when we talk about Garvey and Du Bois and Nkrumah. We get the vision and the hope that gives us an ability to go beyond the pessimism that people are expressing today. Also, there's a question of the link between the intelligentsia and the majority of people. You know, in the United States, anyway, a lot of black people get real sedity sometimes when they uh, begin to uh, focus on the privileges that come from being in a place like this. You know what I mean? Having a little drink at uh, 5 o'clock in the reception. All these little perks that come from being inside institutions that people get sometimes sidetracked and lose a connection to that broader group of people that we ultimately are tied to and therefore have to really be consciously identified with if we've got any real political sense. <laughs> and lastly, of course, these three people use the most advanced means of communication available to them. Why? Because these means of communication are the basis on which they could communicate with that broader community of people that they were connected to in the historical motion of the fight against colonization. Our time now, as I said, is different, but the lessons I've just articulated, I think, apply. My way of thinking about these three men and the movements uh, have led me to sort of codify what I call the ideological framework. Um, everybody has ideology, a view of themselves, the world, and the way they think it ought to be. But I think there are five aspects uh, that you might want to consider in thinking about what is your ideology? What can be our ideology, our consensus at this historical moment? First is identity. Who are we? Where do we center ourselves? And I think that that's not just a question of who we want to be, it's a question of summing up who we are in terms of our relationships, our family, our neighbors, our extended family, the people we're connected with. Secondly, the question of consciousness and analysis, how we analyze the world. A lot of people think that the world is a simple place. In other words, that means they think it is as it used to be. The world today is different than it has been. It requires us to study, and a lot of times, you know, the old heads and you know, that could be 20 years old, but because if your mind is, you know, dealing with the old ideas, well, you're an old head. But my point is, is that all of us need today to engage in a study of the world because it is not the world that Garvey lived in. It's not the world that Du Bois lived in. This is not the time of World War I. The objective conditions are different, and we need to study those conditions in order for us to chart a path to freedom. Then there's a question of commitment. Identity, analysis, commitment. Commitment isn't a verbal rhetorical device that we stand up and, and use or just wave our hands and we're committed, no. Commitment is an assessment 
of how you allocate scarce resources. Fundamentally, it's about time and money. Everybody here is operating on 24-7. All you have to do is figure out how you use that, and that is what you're committed to. Sleep, eat, doing hair. A lot of people spend a lot of time doing things. I don't spend a lot of time doing hair, but everybody understands what I'm talking about. I rub my head, you know. Um, program, plan, action, what you do. So identity analysis, commitment, program, and action. Now, in the information age, I would suggest building on Garvey, Du Bois, and Nkrumah two basic things. We're going to be dealing with this in a workshop. I also want to give my respects to Tom Blair, who organized the Digital Diaspora Workshop. So I'm inviting you to join us in that. But the point is, the first two points. First point is that when we talk about these people in the past in general, we have to begin to engage with what we call cyber resurrection. Everybody got that? <laughs> now, here's what I mean. We now have a limited but important set of archives everywhere in the world. But a lot of the material that we need about these individuals, about movements, about organizations, and so on, represent virtually dead information because it's in archives that are not accessed except by specialists and people who physically are close to those archives. Now, if you go to Jamaica, if you go to Ghana, archives are scarcely being protected. So cyber resurrection means the digitization of the archives so that we can breathe life into these archives. We can click our way into the documents and we can access this knowledge. I actually mean something beyond that because what I'm talking about is the actual consolidation of all of the print, audio, and visual materials constructed in a way that they are interactive so that we'll be able to, in effect, sit down and have a conversation with Garvey or with Malcolm or with Nkrumah, interrogating their ideas by having instantaneous, accessible, electronic, and coordinated archives, images and sound, so that our students and for ourselves, that we'll be able to access things in ways that will be incredibly immediate. They will, in effect, live again. This, I mean, are you hearing me? They're not living now. They're on your bookshelves. A few phrases, a few quotes, but the fullness and the complexity of ideas that are contained in thousands of pages and hundreds of hours of audio and visual materials are not accessible to us really. But they can be if we take seriously the information age in which we now live. We must liberate the archives. The second point is the development of a digital diaspora. Now, everybody knows that already. You're using email to talk to your relatives. We have spontaneous individualism now. It's cheap, it's fast, and everybody's doing it. And if you're not doing it, you're paying too much money and it's taking too much time. But what we need to do is to think about how to breathe life into the institutional structures of the diaspora. Let me just mention two quick things and I'll shut up. First is, just went to Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio is where the profits from the rubber industry are located. That's where Firestone, Goodyear were based in the United States, state of Ohio. Liberia is where the rubber, rubber came from. Garvey had an opportunity at one point to plan a uh, activity in Liberia, which would have placed him and the UNIA and the global African community in relationship to that rubber. Ask the people in Akron, they, well, they'd know that the archives are there in Firestone, 
but, and here's Liberia, we know what shape Liberia is in today. So this digital diaspora is supposed to liberate the archives of Firestone so we can tell the story of Liberia. And we can engage Liberians in understanding and the people in Akron in understanding and that can come together. But it's not a rhetorical thing. You can stand up in Akron and say I'm an African. You can stand in Liberia and say I'm an African. But if you want to take seriously Garvey, Du Bois, and Nkrumah, you have to make that a programmatic activity in which, in fact, you identify a problem and you organize people who are integrally involved in that problem to have a solution. It's not a rhetorical question. It's an immediate political project. And I've got more to say. Come to the workshop.